So we're going to continue on with our discussion about thermodynamics today. And we're going to talk about energy changes occurring in a chemical reaction. We will need some of this information on the lab that we will do on Friday. Okay, so the lab later on this week will be using some of this material. And we are dealing with energy changes that are occurring when chemical reactions take place. We talked earlier in this unit about bonds being broken and bonds being made when we have chemical reactions occurring. That takes energy. So we're going to look at some of the energy changes that are taking place. Okay, Some of these changes involve heat. Okay, That's where we get the thermodynamics. The thermodynamics because of the heat involved in these changes. Exothermic. Ever heard of it? Okay. Now let's break it down. What's what do you think exo? Out or leaving, so the heat is leaving in an exothermic reaction. So exothermic is a reaction that releases energy in the form of heat. If I look at this particular equation, I can see that what is going on is I am taking the combination of solid carbon, reacting it with oxygen from the air probably, to yield carbon dioxide in the gaseous form. When I do so, I have a release of 393.5 kilojoules of energy. 393.5 kilojoules of energy. How do I know that this is an exothermic reaction? Where are my kilojoules at in the equation? They're at the product side. When they're at the product side, where are they doing? They're gone. They're being released. Okay? So when I take the carbon, mix it with oxygen to get carbon dioxide, I release that many, 393.5 kilojoules of heat. Now, the law of conservation of energy. Okay, somewhat like you guys are most familiar with the law of conservation of mass. Law of conservation of mass says that mass cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed in a chemical reaction. Well, the law of conservation of energy is similar, except for we're not dealing with mass, we're dealing with energy. So, it states that energy is neither created nor is it destroyed during a chemical process. Where does the energy come from? Chemical bonds that are holding the oxygen molecules 
and the carbon atoms together. So that energy comes from the bonds that are holding my reactants together. Remember we talked, bonds need to be broken, new bonds need to be made. Garrett? Say again. I didn't hear the last part. No, 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 no. Because we have endothermic reactions where they have to take in energy. That's what we're going to take talk about next. His question, Garrett's question was, will, when we're having these chemical reactions, will they always release energy? No, no, because they could be endothermic, which is coming up next. Now, the energy that is stored in the carbon-oxygen bonds of carbon dioxide is less than the energy in the oxygen-oxygen and carbon-carbon bonds. So basically, what that is saying, this sentence is that the energy that is needed to make the products, in this case, is lower than the energy that is broken in the reactants. So, we have energy left over. Once again, it doesn't take as much energy to form carbon dioxide than it does to break the oxygen-oxygen bond and the carbon-carbon bond. So, in this case, in this case, we have energy being released. But like we were talking about there with Garrett, is that always the case? Absolutely not. Because you're going to see here on this next slide that we're talking endothermic reaction. Now, what does endo mean in terms of our prefixes? Coming in. Okay, entering, endothermic reaction is strictly meaning if we break it down that heat's coming in. It needs heat to occur. So an endothermic reaction is a reaction in which energy is absorbed. Energy is absorbed. Here's a reaction right here. We have done this with something similar. We did not use calcium carbonate. We used sodium carbonate in the lab. We put the sodium carbonate in a crucible. But what did we have to do to it to get the reaction to occur? Okay, If you can remember way back when, we had to heat the crucible to get that reaction to occur. So in order to break the bonds that are holding this calcium carbonate together here, we need to add this much heat, 178.1 kilojoules. Now notice where the heat is in the chemical reaction. Which side is it on? It's on the reactant side. So that tells me that I need this heat. If I set that calcium carbonate in a crucible and don't heat it, what's going to happen? Nothing. Because I don't have the required amount of energy to break the bonds. Okay? I don't have the required amount of energy to break the bonds. Stop and think about when we had the magnesium metal in the crucible. Would that ever react if I didn't heat it? No. Okay, no. So we need a certain amount of heat. That would definitely be an endothermic reaction. So that leads me to a thermochemical equation.
A thermochemical equation is an equation that includes the amount of heat produced or absorbed by a reaction. Have you ever seen a thermochemical equation? What do you think? Probably, I heard. Anybody else got an idea? Maddie says probably. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever seen an equation that included the amount of heat? Didn't we just see two of them? So those two equations that we just talked about are both thermochemical equations because they tell us how much heat is either released or absorbed. All right, so if I go back a slide, here is a thermochemical equation because we do not have to put that in there, do we? What we had been doing is we've just been putting the delta above our yield sign to say we needed to heat it, right? Now we're saying, okay, we need to add this much heat for that reaction to occur. If we do not, it will not happen. I don't need to add the delta sign on this because I have an actual amount of heat. Okay? Now, here are two different types of reaction pathways that are shown here. Now, notice on the left-hand side, my reactants have, and my axis right here, this is energy, and this is a course of reaction if you can't see it, okay? Course of reaction, energy. The big part that I want you to understand, look up here. The reactants have very high energy. The products have very low energy. So what type of a reaction is this? Okay, it's an exothermic. Okay, I could come up here and get the change in the heat, couldn't I? I could get the change in the heat given off, the energy given off, just by subtracting those two. Now look at this side. This side has the reactants being very low and the products very high. So I could take this, all right, I could take this and determine how much energy has changed. Now the key part, the key part, and we haven't even talked about delta H yet. That will be later. Delta H is later. But the key part of this that you need to make sure you write down is this right here. If delta H is negative, what type of a reaction is it? Exothermic. If delta H is negative, it's an exothermic reaction. If delta H is positive, it is an endothermic reaction. So those are the key, one of the key aspects of this chart that you need to be aware of. Garrett? Yes. If we have an endothermic reaction occurring, and I would fill the container, it would feel colder. Have you ever had a cool pack? You know, I've seen paramedics get out a pack and break the pack, and all of a sudden it gets really, really, really cold, and they put it on the injury because they don't have ice right there. Okay? Those cool packs are endothermic. They're taking the heat in during the reaction, so it feels like it's cold. Now, vice versa on that, I'm sure at one time or another, you've had a heat pack, right? 
to warm up your hands. Okay, certain certain ones of those, and I'm not saying all of them, because my baseball players used to have heat packs that they put in their back pocket and put their hand in there to keep it warm on cold days. Okay, I'm not saying all of them are are exothermic reactions, but there are some that occur that are exothermic reactions. Okay, some of them aren't even reactions at all because do you remember when we had the super saturated solution in the one pack and we clicked a little disc and it, it came out and got all warm. I did that as a demo, okay? That is not even a reaction. That's just heat being released by the super saturated solution. Okay, so not all of those are exothermic, but some of them are, some of them are. Now, the final thing we're going to talk about, the new stuff today, we're going to also work another entropy question here when we're completed. But the last thing we're going to talk about is specific heat. You got a little bit of an intro to specific heat on the lab that you just turned in. Okay? Because you dealt with that CP. CP is the specific heat, the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius, or one Kelvin. It uses both scales because Kelvin, one degree Kelvin, and one degree Celsius are the same. The only thing Kelvin does not account for negative values. Absolute zero on the Kelvin scale is zero. So the specific heat is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. Specific heat is one of the reasons that water has some of the most unique properties because the, the specific heat of water is fairly high. As I switch my slides here, okay, I show you some values of specific heat. And notice some of the higher ones that you see up there are water, ice, and water vapor. Okay, this chart, no, I don't think this chart's important for you to write down. You can find this chart if you need it again somewhere by just, you know, Googling specific heat. So I don't think it's necessary to write this down. But I just wanted to show you that, yes, indeed, water has a high specific heat. Now, what does specific heat actually mean again? How much energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius. So by having a high specific heat, it's going to take a decent amount of energy compared to something that has a lower specific heat, such as lead, okay? Such as copper, such as iron. If you put iron, on one of our heating plates back there, that heat will transfer into that iron fairly quickly, won't it? And you're not gonna wanna pick it up because it'll be hot. Well, that heat won't transfer into the water quite so quick because of the specific heat. It needs more energy to heat up that water than it will to heat up these metals down here. Does that look familiar, anyone? How does that look familiar? That was in the lab that we calculated. That was the second one because if you remember right, I told you, make sure that you use this mass as being the mass of water that is cooling, not the mass of ice that melted, right? Now, once again, Q, 
Okay? The lab clearly explained that Q was the heat that was gained or lost. Cp, once again, is a specific heat. M is the mass of the sample. The mass that is being heated, or it could be cooled, as we saw in the lab. And finally, delta T is the change in temperature. So we kind of did this like the IPS labs went. You remember how you did the lab in IPS, and then you took the notes over it and learned about it? Okay. So we were introduced to this in the lab. And now here's our notes over the specific heat. Now, that is all the new notes that I have for you. All right, we are going to work this entropy problem. It says, green plants synthesize glucose by photosynthesis as shown in the following reaction. Okay, this shouldn't be a new reaction. You've seen this in biology. Six carbon dioxide will react with six water molecules to yield glucose, C6H12O6, and oxygen. Now, we are going to find the change of entropy at standard conditions. So in order to do so, I know that... Delta S zero is equal to S sub zero of the products minus S, I guess it's super zero. Of the reactants. So what are my products? What are my products here? Glucose and oxygen, right? So, I am going to find my standard entropy for glucose. C6H12O6 as a solid. And I see that it is 212.1. Okay, that is my first reactant, or excuse me, product. What is my second product? Oxygen gas, right? Now, if you remember from yesterday, oxygen gas is with the hydrogen, or excuse me, with the, well, yeah, with the oxygens. I guess water is the one we couldn't find yesterday. Oxygen gas is what? 205.0, but how many oxygens do we have? Six. So, I have to take six. I have to take six times the 205.0 joules mole Kelvin. Close my parentheses. So my products are going to be my products are going to be 1442.1 1. Agreed? 1442.1 joules over mole times Kelvin. My math right? All right. 
Now, I need to do the products, or excuse me, the reactants. So I put the minus sign. I'm going to do my reactants in a different color just so you can see it. Okay? Just so I, you can see it. And in order to conserve room, I'm not going to put a label on them until the end. So in order to conserve some room, I'm going to label them at the end. But I have carbon dioxide as a gas, and I have six of them. So I find CO2 as a gas, 213.6. I find water as a liquid, 69.91, but I have six of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this big bracket around that to make sure that I do all of that math-wise before I subtract it. Okay, so I'm going to take... 213.6, multiply it by 6. That gives me a value. Then I'm going to take 69.91, multiply it by 6. Gives me a value. And when I add those together, I'm going to get 1701. 0 0.06, and now I'm going to put my label on it since I've got room down here. Joules, mole, Kelvin. My other value is 1442.1 joules, mole, Kelvin. So as I go down just a little bit more, what I'm going to do is I am going to take 1442.1 and I'm going to subtract the value I just got, the 17. So I get a value of 258.96 joules over mole times Kelvin. So are we gaining or losing entropy? We're losing entropy from reactants to products. Correct? Now what do you think? We got a thumbs up with that? This could be, I mean, this might be one of the tougher ones. The problem that I see people have, can anybody guess what do you think the problem is, Kyle? Switch products and reactants, absolutely. One of the biggest problems. What do you think another one you could possibly see? Oh, they forget something, but it's not necessarily negative. They forget to... The coefficients, okay? They forget the coefficients. They just get the value off the charts and not do anything with the coefficients. All right? We okay with this? Okay. Got about four minutes if you want to work on WebAssign.